Great. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm told that uh, we have a pretty big uh, lunchtime seminar going on here. Maybe uh, 100, 120 people have joined already. So thank you very much for taking some time out of your day to join our discussion here at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation on uh, COVID-19 and democratic governance around the world. One silver lining of this pandemic, if you could call it that, uh, a silver lining, may be that we become much more aware of how different societies all around the world are responding to crises like the pandemic that we're in. At the Ash Center Democracy Program, each year we bring people from all around the world who are seeking to understand and address the main challenges to democracy and work together to imagine ways to, democ to deepen democracy all around the world. And so we thought we'd take advantage of this moment to bring together some of our worldwide alums to share their experiences and insights into how their societies are addressing COVID-19 and how COVID-19 is affecting their democracies. We have uh, three great, great ASH alumni here. Brigitte Gazelle is beaming in tonight from Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, where she is professor for comparative politics, focuses, focusing on the Federal Republic of Germany. She directs the university's unit on democratic innovation, which seeks to understand and document a wide range of novel forms of citizen participation. Uh, they also seek to examine the effects of participatory innovations and ask questions like, can participation mobilize people who do not usually participate in politics? Does participatory innovation change the extent of uh, citizens' influence on government, and can uh, citizen participation help to address social and economic inequality? Pepper Call Pepper is coming to us uh, today and tonight, where he is, and indeed our European um, friends are, from Oxford University, where he is the Blavatnik Chair in Government and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government. Prior to uh, going there to Oxford, he taught at the European University Institute, and uh, before that at the Harvard Kennedy School where he and I were colleagues. His research focuses on the intersection between capitalism and democracy, both in politics and in public policy. His most recent fantastic book is Quiet Politics and Business Power, Corporate Control in Europe and Japan. You should check it out if you're interested in the mechanisms of business power. And he's written many other books and articles on comparative politics and the governance of capitalism. Tommy uh, Porges Peg, <laughs> Uh, Pogras Vinche uh, focuses on politics and democracy in Brazil, but she's actually coming to us tonight from Berlin, where she is a senior uh, researcher at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin and associate professor of political science at the Institute for Political and Social Studies at the University of Rio in Brazil. She works on democratic theory and comparative politics. Her main research seeks to understand the impact of democratic innovations on the quality of democracy and uh, tries to understand dimensions of the quality of democracy, including responsiveness, accountability, equality, competition. And uh, the main empirical focus of Tommy's work is Latin America. Okay, so I thought I'd begin just by laying out uh, 30 second hot takes. For those of you who've been following uh, COVID-19 in the popular press and the, what the pundits have to say about it, some, uh, uh, one sentence summary of what's going on in these different countries. In Brazil, a lot of the popular media has been critical, especially about Bolsonaro's denial of the disease and uh, especially concerned with a very large number of very, very vulnerable people in Brazil. So that's my hot take on Brazil. Hot take on the United Kingdom is maybe the, uh, there were some early missteps with herd immunity and then uh, the reversal of that relatively early on. So maybe the United Kingdom got a late start, but thanks to the civil service and, um, and vigorous government effort, uh, maybe society and government are getting on top of the COVID crisis now. That's a hot take for United Kingdom. Hot take for Germany uh, is that it's the success story of Europe. Maybe through some combination of investments in the health system, competent central government, competent federal system in the states. There's been good action at the state level. And so that's led to lots of testing and uh, fairly, actually very low recorded fatality rates so far. So those are, that's a quick gloss. Certainly those at that level, the 40,000 foot level, uh, those things certainly have a lot of problems with those descriptions. And so the point of this discussion is to arrive at a deeper understanding of 
what's going on in these places and uh, what uh, what is going on both in disease response and in democratic governance in the face of this pandemic. So uh, first round of questions, maybe uh, we'll start with uh, Brigitte and then go to Tammy mm -hmm. and then go to Pepper, okay? So the first question for you guys, what should people from outside your country know about how the response to coronavirus is going inside your country? Can you mm -hmm. think of some things that your country is doing well and some things that need to go better? Brigitte? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, great question. Um, let me first clarify maybe my position. I'm aware that I'm speaking from a perspective of a country where COVID um, has not even 6,000 deaths. With 80 million people, I mean, this is almost nothing. Um, but on the other hand, we are all restricted. Our lives are very much restricted by very severe uh, measures, which made sense. But anyway, so just to make sure that you understand the perspective I'm speaking from. So the first question, what went well? Um, I think there are many things. For example, the, the intensive care beds in Germany, they were very fast and they were very, they have, we have so many beds that are now empty that even some, some hospitals say, oh my God, we don't have enough people, sick people. So this is just fun, but they're really sufficient intensive care beds. One of the good things was, of course, that possibly not, not good for us, but not good for the Italians, that we could observe what happened in Italy. So we were kind of prepared. Of course, we, we knew what was coming or we could see the development. So we were very fast with the intensive care beds. We were very fast with rules on social distancing, adjusted to the regions because in Germany we have a federal system and it's, I mean, it's very, very different. For example, in mecklenburg vorpommern one state, we just have 16, not 60, 16 deaths up to now. Whereas in Bavaria, it's more than 1000. So very different in different states, it's very different. So and adjusted um, in the federal system. I mean, very fast, the rules were made for social distancing, like closing schools and so on and so on. And now we have a very good, uh, no, maybe not good, but we have a support program. The government, the, the national government and also the, the state governments have decided on several types of support programs which help those who mm, suffered. It has some problems, but at least we have this problem. And we have this program. Considering the story about the high number of tests, this is only partly true. It's different in different mm -hmm. states. Like where I live, it's very difficult to get a test. In other states, it's easy. So just to keep that in mind. But so, mm -hmm. so the problems and challenges, I also have three points. And I, I can please, I mean, if I'm too long, please just let me know if I have to speak no, too long. No, this is great. This is fantastic. I think probably okay. most people outside of Germany don't know these dimensions. So it's oh, OK. OK, um, so my, I have three points considering the problems or challenges of what is not so good, what is not working so well. One is who suffers, who makes decisions. The second is what happened to basic rights. And the third is who benefits from the benefits, from the social benefits. The first thing, who suffers and who makes the decisions. Um, one problem that really popped up in the last weeks was that those who are most affected by the cut down, by the shutdown, by the measures, have not been involved in the decision-making procedure. And I just want to mention two uh, open letters that have just recently in the last weeks or so been um, published, two open letters to the government. One was by parents, mainly younger women and, um, who are already signed by hundreds of people. Um, the closing of the kindergarten and the schools made it especially difficult for women um, uh, to, to go on with their lives. So in Germany, we have, for example, more than 2 million single parents. I mean, and they have to stay home, they can't work. We have 11 million families with children who can't work. I mean, Tami is a good example uh, with, with Hannah at side. So, um, but when you look at the decision-making people and the experts, there are very few women and there are hardly any single parents. It's mostly men about 50 who made the decisions. So in this letter, um, in this open letter, the, the parents, uh, they said, we want to be heard and we want to be included in decision-making procedures affecting our lives so dramatically. The second open letter is by owners of small restaurants and pubs or self-employed people. Again, it's the same thing. People who made the decisions, they're all in, in good living positions. They all are employed. They all have their monthly paychecks. I mean, like us, we don't have to, we don't have to worry. 
but those people um, who are self-employed and so on, they, they want to be heard in the decision-making procedures. They are affected dramatically, but they were not included. Again, it was men over 50, mostly men, and in very in good positions, they didn't have to care. Uh, two days ago, uh, our president of the, the president of the German parliament, Wolfgang Schäuble, um, he, he kind of realized what's going on and he, remind, he reminded us that health, and he said health, health protection is important, but not every decision can be subordinated to COVID. And we also have to consider all the uh, economic, the social, the psychological consequences of each COVID measure. So this is like where the German parliament or at least the president is now standing at. The second point is what happened to basic rights. Some state governments have restricted or even abandoned basic rights, for example, the right to demonstrate. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court not long ago has declared this is not constitutional. So people have the right to demonstrate. With all, I mean, health protection measures and they have so have social distancing, but the right to demonstrate is a basic right that cannot be taken away. It was a decision by the Supreme Court and the state governments, government, uh, state governments had to um, adjust. So that, that was a good thing. Again, there are a couple of open uh, uh, letters by different kinds of non-governmental organizations who exactly say um, basic rights must be guaranteed. Also data protection is another topic, must be um, guaranteed even in times of Corona. Again, Schäuble two days ago, the president of the parliament reminded us that health, health protection is important, but basic rights must be granted also in this time. So again, these two points, I can't agree more what Arshon said about the need for more participatory democracy. My third point is who benefits from social benefits. We have a huge support program with 300 million people but I mean, as it looks like big companies like Lufthansa uh, are already demanding a lot of millions of money because they have lost a lot of loss, of course. Whereas all these um, self-employed people, yes, they got 5,000 euro, but this is not really enough to survive. And um, for some occupations, for some jobs, the shutdown is like an occupational ban. They cannot work anymore. I mean, just one maybe very easy understandable example is, fairground workers. I mean, all fairgrounds are closed for the whole summer. There will nothing, there will not be a fairground anywhere. So they cannot work. So this is just, um, and the highly praised reduction hours compensation for employed people, which we have is, is a means to relieve for business owners and employers. So they get money from the state so they can get the, get the money to the, to, the, to the workers. So who benefits from the benefits, the social benefits. Let's see um, who at the end will really benefit. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. That was a, a whole layer of considerations that is very much beyond the immediate level of response. So I think that's really enlightening for people. Good. Okay. Tommy, do, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Brazil and what's going on? I know you're, uh, you're not in Brazil, but I imagine that you're following uh, developments there fairly closely. Yeah, sure. So hi, Afon. Hi, everybody. So exactly, I'm not in Brazil. I'm Brazilian, um, and I'm a Brazil scholar. But and for the first time, it's interesting that this crisis goes so on our personal lives that is different uh, to analyze and uh, and try to really come up with what's really going on when you're not there feeling what is taking place. Anyway, um, I would say about Brazil is going on like not only a health crisis and a political crisis and an economic crisis, it's all together and the political crisis is going deeper and deeper despite the health crisis. Um, I, I think somehow we can um, look at Brazil now and see the three big problems related to this crisis, all of them. Um, first is lack of knowledge and reliable data. Um, lack of transparency and accountability, and lack of both state capacity and democratic governance. So I think those are the three major problems. I will comment on each of them uh, quickly. So first thing, the dimension of the outbreak is totally unknown. <clears throat> People have really no idea of what is going on because the government 
is in denial as I started at the beginning. So Bolsonaro, the president, he's like really denying the crime and he even denies that there is such a thing so dangerous as the coronavirus. For him, it's like a little flu. Um, so there is no actual information. There is no reliable data on the size of the crisis. So under-reporting is a huge problem. There is very little testing uh, being done. Brazil is one of the countries with the less, uh, the least number of tests per capita. So I think I'm sure last week around 150 tests more or less have been made. Uh, in Germany, in only one week, three, 350,000 tests are done, I think. So it's really nothing in a huge population of say over 200 um, um, a million people. So um, the official numbers yesterday were that they were like close to 62,000 of cases and uh, like 4,200 deaths. But uh, there is one research from the University of Minas Gerais that says that actually the number must be eight times um, more than that. And another research from the University of Sao Paulo says that it's actually 16 times more, so around 800,000 cases. Um, it's difficult to, to really have an idea of how big it is. So it's crazy, but uh, the overcrowding in morgues and cemeteries somehow work as an indicator. I mean, uh, they receive more um, people per day, I mean, more uh, dead people per day who died from respiratory problems than the daily number of uh, analogous deaths. So uh, people are not being tested. Even when they got sick, um, even when they are in intensive care units, and even when they die. Under reporting then hinders appropriate responses, and under counting becomes a dangerous tool for a populist president. So definitely there is a need of more information, therefore more knowledge and more reliable data, more data and reliable data. And uh, the second big problem, I think, is the lack of transparency and accountability. So uh, the severity, the gravity of the outbreak is totally underestimated. So we have a president saying the coronavirus is a fantasy, a figment of imagination, something the media is making up and exaggerating. He downplays the severity of um, the disease all the time, like saying it's just a little flu. Um, he is himself against social isolation. Uh, it's not only his political position, but he also does not practice social dis distancing himself. So it's just last week, he joined a manifestation. It was actually a manifestation claiming for military intervention. So, so crazy is the situation in the country uh, right now. And he was there in the middle of the people and he was talking like he was sick and he was there. Um, so he's uh, doing a lot of responsible um, things like also recommending the use of the hydroxychloroquine, which is something we know uh, already very well, um, how dangerous it is. But he was like, um, also like in the US, like publicly recommending that. So there is need of truth, need of science, um, evidence-based policies in the shoes. There is nothing of that at all. Finally, lack of both state capacity and democratic governance. Uh, the federal government behaves completely, completely responsibly and dangerously. The president has no institutional leadership at all, no competence for coordination of the crisis. The state governors are acting much more responsibly and are much more accountable somehow than the president himself. But then the president antagonizes with the state governor all the time and with anyone else who thinks different than him. So he just fired his health minister 10 days ago uh, after like publicly disagreeing with him for weeks uh, because of things like social distancing being necessary. Um, so uh, on the other side, we got the state capacity as well. The public health system is already overwhelmed in some states and cities especially in the north of the country. So in Brazil, there is this big problem also uh, with the regional disparities. Um, um, and uh, Brazil has not reached the peak of the crisis yet. 
well, the number of intensive care units is surprise, surprisingly not that low uh, as one could expect for a country like Brazil. And that's due to the country's high number of victims of violence and, uh, and traffic accidents. Uh, apparently, there is, there is like a relative uh, high number um, of intensive um, care units. And then also Brazil uh, has the, the SUS, the National Health Care System, um, which is free and universal. It's actually a democ the democratic legacy um, of the country. But it always lacked resources. And in recent years, resources have been severely cut. So it's really complicated, this, the, this situation. Uh, that is like 20 intensive care um, units for 100 thousand inhabitants, um, which is not that low, but it's still very low. Um, so research, official research says 20% more, at least it's necessary, but other research says much more. And the federal government is doing nothing about that. So since the outset of the crisis, um, it promised to deliver more 2,000 more intensive care units. And on Friday, he just delivered 300. So there is need of actual responses of health plans and policies, like real guidelines for public health. There is nothing like that. Tests, also antibody tests, equipment for health professionals, um, hospital equipment, well, everything. So um, it's complicated. All right, well, I, I wanna give Pepper a chance, but I do wanna come back about uh, whether or not the state responses and, and, and whether or not the municipal capacity, health capacity has maybe filled some of the gaps where national leadership has been lacking. But I'll come back on that. Pepper, what about the UK? You yourself um, are socially distancing in, in your house so, in Oxford. Well, I, I, I am you know, sitting here in my bedroom here in Oxford. Um, so I, I can, um, I feel bad after Tommy's laid out all the uh, issues in Brazil, um, uh, dragging the United Kingdom across the coals. Uh, but in fact, we, we've been um, pretty much, so Archon talked about having a slow start uh, and his implication was that we've then somehow caught back up. And so uh, if, if the impression you have is that we have had a slow start, but now we've, we've been a model of good governance since, um, so I would, I would not share that impression. Uh, and so I would, I, I, I mean, I'd like to just talk about briefly some of the things that maybe cause what's going on and, and why we're still behind. Um, and so I would say three things. I would say uh, salience, science, and centralization. Um, so in terms of salience, uh, that's you know, how much people care about an issue. Uh, no one was talking about COVID-19 uh, in January because we had just had um, uh, a, a general election in December, which was fought entirely on the issue of Brexit. Um, and the, the conservatives won a smashing victory, uh, and they were very interested in consolidating that victory and sort of reshaping the electorate because a lot of um, Midlands and Northern uh, towns that had never voted for conservatives before had voted for them. So they were thinking about the project of getting Brexit done um, and trying to level up to the North, uh, as it was called. Um, and because that was the focus, um, the sort of mechanism, so Archon talked about the, the well-functioning civil service, which I think is one of the strengths of the country, um, but it hasn't been particularly well um, in, incorporated into agenda setting because it wasn't on the front page of, uh, of sort of what policymakers were concerned about until very late. And so Boris Johnson skipped a bunch of COBRA meetings, which was the emergency planning uh, group uh, for the government in February. Uh, because he was interested in other things, um, in, including vacations with his fiance. But that's fine. Uh, everyone's entitled to some vacation, uh, but, but maybe it wouldn't be great if he had pursued it at that point. So in terms of science, um, the civil servants themselves were a little bit unlucky because they, uh, the UK had a plan. It sort of had an influenza pandemic plan. And that's what it, uh, that was its baseline plan. And given that there was this, um, this group of expert scientists who disagreed among themselves about um, how exactly to think about, uh, you know, what the appropriate response was to, uh, to the, what was called the coronavirus at that time. Um, the, the UK very much fell back on its influenza plan, which um, didn't uh, anticipate um, that you would need so much distancing and, and sort of led people towards what became known as the herd uh, immunity model. Um, and so I think uh, even our civil service, which uh, is really good on, on many issues like this, was a little bit behind the curve because Essentially, they were unlucky. They had the wrong model um, until um, until Neil Ferguson's model came out uh, from Imperial in, in, in early March. Uh, and finally, in centralization, um, this is a long-standing story of the, of the UK government. 
that they don't trust uh, um, local governments to do anything because local governments don't have constitutional standing. Um, and so therefore drawing in information from below um, and allowing local governments, local authorities to make deals uh, to overcome all the shortages we have in terms of ventilator shortages, um, uh, personal protective equipment shortages, um, that sort of was something that the government has never uh, caught up on. And similarly, it's not very good at, at partnering with business. Um, it hasn't had a good record of partnering with business. So those have been some of our, uh, th they slowed us down and they keep slowing us down. And we had this sort of uh, pledge about testing uh, where we've been lamentable on testing. So I myself, I think I've had COVID-19, um, but I wasn't able to get tested because you know we were way under testing. And my neighbor, who's a doctor, thought, thought his wife had COVID-19 and therefore he couldn't go to work uh, and was out of um, the medical service for two weeks and couldn't get a test uh, because there simply weren't enough tests. You could not test even if you were a doctor in the National Health Service. Um, so we've been really slow on that and we've been trying to ramp up, but because of these failings, we haven't been able to ramp up. So having said all that, um, we're doing a couple of things right, I think. Uh, one, um, Despite a great run of good weather, which you never have in this country, um, people are largely obeying uh, social distancing uh, and largely staying inside, despite the fact that we've had um, a relatively light touch government order to do so. They're saying, please stay inside, but um, you don't get um, sort of fines for going out um, and, and exercising if you don't have a piece of paper, as, as for example, you do in France. So um, that's, th that's sort of general goodwill and general rallying around that I think you've got in a lot of countries we've had here. And it's particularly nice here because just as Tommy said about um, the, the National Health Service uh, is a legacy of, of democracy in Brazil, it's, it's, it's the crown jewel of the welfare state here and it's enormously um, politically popular. Uh, and so the, because the NHS, uh, as we call it, um, is so popular, there's a very defined institution of government that we can rally around and support and we go out and clap for the NHS every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Uh, and that, that's widely observed and has been for five weeks. So um, that sort of uh, rallying point has been very helpful in bringing people together. So that, that's probably on the good side. And that's fantastic, Pepper. Thank you very much for that. Um, before I turn it over, before I open it up for questions, people should actually start typing questions, comments, et cetera, into uh, the YouTube um, chat box. I don't, I'm not sure what the right terminology is, but there's there's a way you can type in questions that you want our, uh, us to address or comments that you want us to react to. And so people should uh, start entering those. Um, before we turn to those, I just kind of wanted to have a quick lightning round to get you to reflect a little bit. This is especially true for Tammy, but then also for Pepper and uh, Brigitte about the relative kind of contribution and dynamic of political leadership, especially at the national level, and then either local government or civil society at the lower level. I mean, tell me from your description, the, the national level leadership on COVID-19 has just been a disaster, but lots of people in Brazil know that it's a real threat. And so I imagine are responding either themselves by taking action or perhaps at state level governments. And then you know, you and I have thought a little bit about the municipal health councils that have been built up over the last decade, decade and a half. So maybe there's some uh, municipal capacity. And, uh, you know, similarly in the UK and Germany, what is the relative um, effort or level of action and activity from central government versus sometimes with, sometimes in despite, uh, uh, central government efforts, what are people at the local and civil society levels doing to deal with this all society threat? So Tammy, maybe if you could speculate, just, just brief answers and then we'll we'll open it up to the broader discussion. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, yes, the thing is Brazil is a federation, but it does not work as a federation like for example here in Germany, where actually um, at the state level governors can really take decisions um, themselves that are different from one another and, uh, and from different from the federal government. Um, and, and you have the, the, the national health system. So you depend a lot still on the federal government. Um, at the state level, you do have some governors who are trying to do more, but, it, but it's still, Brazil is a very complicated moment uh, politically, I would say, where you have like big states like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, um, who doesn't really have, um, I would say, 
more responsible governments than the federal one, but still, um, from the point of view of democratic governments, um, definitely um, are not like a um, good leaderships or democratic good uh, leaderships, um, I would say. Um, you asked about the health councils, what is going on in civil society, and I would say, unfortunately, very little. I mean, we have this say, right wing populist authoritarian president, uh, and somehow civil society is really um, frozen, so to say. Um, there are some voices, people try to raise their voices, um, even, even um, health professionals or researchers, but it's, it's very hard. So there had been a lot of cuts uh, of investments on research um, over the last few years, and especially since Bolsonaro is in power, like pretty huge cuts. Uh, so it's complicated. Uh, so people can't do much. Like uh, even at the state level, you cannot also make more investments. And that the key states like you and Sao Paulo, uh, those are also not confirmed. Uh, so somehow science uh, and research in the in the entire country is, is being dismantled, and the same I would say uh, for all democratic structures. So um, from the point of view of civil society, I think at the moment also people are trying to survive um, a lot, and then there had been of course initiatives, uh, some solidarity, some democratic solidarity. Uh, but now, actually, the, 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 the country is looking up to the political crisis a lot, uh, which, which is I like that Bolsonaro just fired his minister of justice, the Moro, the, the gold judge um, who ran the Lava Jato operation. And then now uh, it looks like um, there will be an impeachment process. Um, at least that's what um, I hope, and uh, many people hope. But many people do not hope that. Um, and uh, Bolsonaro still has a uh, many supporters, uh, people who are going out in the streets uh, supporting him and with him against um, social isolation and um, asking to open up uh, the economy and, and so on. So people are way too blind also to see what's going on. Um, but I hope uh, somehow that also civil society and and somehow democratic forces um, will, will um, be able to, to make even more visible um, how much um, he's not able uh, to run the country and how responsible um, he is right now. Thank you very much. Pepper, do you want to jump in and uh, elaborate a little bit? I mean, it sounds like the UK primarily at the expectation, the reality of central government leadership, and when that's not really present, people kind of wait for it. But maybe that's not the case exactly. So uh, if you saw Dunkirk, um, Dunkirk sort of gives <laughs> you a sense of, of the spirit of the country. Uh, and so they were looking for uh, 250,000 volunteers uh, when, when lockdown started uh, to help with the NHS, and they got overnight 750,000, right? They got so many they couldn't uh, handle it. So in terms of uh, it, it's, it's in terms of civil society participation, uh, it's very rich. But um, it, if you go back to Dunkirk, in Dunkirk, everyone just went over with their own little boats. But now there's kind of this um, layer of bureaucracy that somehow is keeping the little boats from getting in to be able to help the government. And so whether it's you know companies that switched over to make ventilators, and it turns out that the government gave them bad orders to make ventilators, and, and the doctor said, well, we don't want ventilators that do that. Um, or whether it's companies that can can supply the um, the protective equipment, um, they they keep calling government and they can't, they they're, they're not getting a response. So um, I think there's been a lot of push from society uh, because people want to you know be involved and, and want to solve this problem, but they're not really the institutional relays um, in the UK. And absent those, um, except in the case of the the NHS trusts themselves, the NHS is 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 has decentralized around trust, um, and I think there has been some innovation in terms of what they're doing, but. Um, because the institutional infrastructure is one in which um, it's hard to just uh, roll your boat out across the channel uh, and be helpful. Um, the, there hasn't been a way for people to get as involved as they would like. Great. So, uh, you know, Brigitte, as, as I said in the, in the outset, a lot of people in the United States, um, two things. One is, I think, on the progressive side of US politics, people uh, 
are crying out for more competent, more effective central government leadership as a way of uh, criticizing the Trump administration, right? And then they, the, as if it were an obvious point that central government leadership is the way to handle COVID-19. And then sometimes my response is, well, when you say central government leadership is the way to go, really what you're talking about is Germany. You're not talking about France. You're not talking about the UK. You're certainly not talking about the, not talking about Brazil. What you're talking about is Germany. But then Germany is also, as you said, a federal system. So, and, and also there's been a large private sector contribution. So how do we think about the relative roles and contribution of the central government, of Merkel uh, and the central administration and, and government compared to these other layers and forces? Oh, you're muted. Oh, Brigitte, you're muted. So, yeah, there I'm you muted. Go. I'm in. I don't. Um, okay, I would say at the beginning of the crisis, like in February, then March, I mean, the central government or the national government and the state governments were very much in consensus. I mean, uh, with very little differences between the different states, because as I said before, the different states were affected in very, very different ways. I mean, Bavaria was strongly affected, Mecklenburg for Pomeria they had not one death at the beginning. So very differently affected. Um, so at the beginning, nevertheless, there was pretty much of a consensus between the national and the state um, governments. And now it's kind of changing because the national government, Merkel is still wants very strong uh, measurements. Within the state, it's very different. Bavaria wants even stronger, North Rhine Westphalia wants to loosen it up. So now it's a very interesting um, uh, situation, I think. And I think it's very good because they all have to find good arguments for their position. And it's not that just one central government can make all the decisions, which I would not consider as a good idea, um, especially in a big country like Germany, where you have so many different um, areas and regions. So now we have this more controversy within the different governments <laughs> and we'll see what happens. And uh, the local level is very similar. There are so, so, diff so many differences that uh, again, they, um, there's a lot of debate, which I think is a very, very good idea. Coming to civil society, um, I think, as I've said, we, we are now so used or we have so many severe, uh, very strict measures that now civil society, which was very active and good, it's now more a little bit going, what I said, with this open letters that they are now saying, you know, we want to be more included and there are so many problems and the shutdown had so many consequences that might not have been thought through so well at the beginning. So now it's more a little bit more of a debate, how, how can we cope with the shutdown and how can we loosen it or not loosen it? And um, so, and civil society is very strong in, in this um sense too so now with all this open that is asking for more inclusion so um i think this is the main thing to say yeah. very good we have a first question from the audience i don't know how um how you guys how closely you guys have been following the uh, debates about the apps and the contact tracing and opening up right so this is a um, I'm told, I, I, just reading the news, it seems like uh, some of the East Asian countries, um, China and, but also non-authoritarian or non-authoritarian ones, Taiwan and maybe South Korea are using apps to uh, help out with the contact tracing. And so there's in the, in the West, there's a proposal, uh, Google and Facebook, uh, no, I'm sorry, Google and Apple, and full disclosure, I, sometimes I do some work for Apple, so just by way of transparency. Um, Google and Apple have developed a technology that they're proposing to roll out that would allow apps to talk to each other's phones, right? So if uh, I had dinner with Brigitta, uh, our phones would re recognize that we are in some proximity, would record that, and then um, I won't go into all the technological details, but if I ended up um, ha uh, being testing positive for COVID-19, then I could download, upload my information to the National Health Authority and they would, uh, and they would have uh, my contact information in my tree and then they could contact everybody who'd been in proximity with my phone, right? Um, all of the other phones. And so, 
there's a debate now about whether to use those apps, whether to make them mandatory. So if we allow students back on Harvard campus, is a condition that you upload this app so that in case you get sick, it, I, you know, you can trace everybody in your dorm room and your extracurricular activities. And then there's a layer about um, <clears throat> a layer of discussion about the privacy provision. So some versions, all of the data are just straight up uploaded to government without any privacy protections. The one I described, I would have to voluntarily opt into it. And then if I were positively diagnosed, I would have to allow the health authorities to uh, upload my information. So what is the state of debate? I mean, it, if the governments in Germany or the UK or Brazil propose mandatory use of these apps, uh, what is the privacy debate versus, I guess here it's a kind of, you could frame it as a privacy versus public health trade-off, maybe. I'm not sure that it is, but you could frame it that way. Anybody want to jump in? I mean, I can say a word, but I don't want to be... Uh... In Germany, of course, it was a big debate. I mean, it's exactly what you said. It's this data protection privacy problem uh, against the, the health protection. And the, the position of the different ministries at different levels changed several times. Um, at the end, now they say it's a European. It must There must be a European solution. It's, of course, the easiest way to say uh, we can't decide on this. It's just too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it European. Um, I think in Germany, people are reluctant. I think more than half said they are very reluctant because of data protection and privacy. Uh, so they, they're different numbers, but uh, like half half, they wouldn't they wouldn't use it. They wouldn't you know um, put it on their on their smartphones. So um, it's not not more advanced than what you said. Um, also in Germany, there's no final solution for that. So we wait for the European one. <laughs> You're going to be waiting a while for the European solution. <laughs> yes, 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 I know. But I mean, I mean, can you can you imagine our health minister would like enforce it? I mean, it would. In Germany, would it seems hard. To outcry that, yeah. that, that, that couldn't work. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm glad about it because I have data protection issues. I, I yeah. don't want I want my privacy. So that's my, my personal position. Yeah, good. Pepper, I think the NHS is actually developing such such an app. I read that maybe in the Guardian or the FT. I'm not sure if you've been following the state of the debate on this. Uh, well, I've been following the debate generally. I hadn't followed the NHS's development of the app. Um, but you know, my my response to that is, um, well, it only works if you have testing capacity, right? Um, and so uh, let's race ahead to establish the invasive app before we even know how to establish testing capacity. Um, so I, I, I'm not opposed to it. I would, uh, you know, it, um, on the same sort of uh, voluntary grounds uh, th that, that you've talked about, Archon, and I think that's what would be widely acceptable here. Um, th this is a pretty surveilled society. Um, and so I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think people would have a large problem given the public health mm -hmm. concerns and given the, the alternative of staying in lockdown for a long, long time uh, of, of signing up. But um, I, think you, I, I think the thing we need to rely on there is the kind of robust civil society pushback against overreach and government overuse. Um, and you know, those in the European Union have uh, that GDPR protection we do for the time being, but I think there would need to be a strong social push for that to, to maintain that over time. So Philip uh, on the YouTube chat asks a question I've been wondering about myself. Um, could any panelists comment on the situation in Sweden? So Sweden took uh, quite evidently quite a different path from almost every state in the United States and almost everywhere else in Europe. They decided not to enforce harsh social distancing. Philip says, I hear that they've never closed their primary schools. Is this true? And how is it working for them? What do you sitting in Germany or the UK, which is practicing strict social distancing, look over a few countries and see Sweden is not? Mm -hmm. I mean, Sweden did a couple of things, for example, they are very careful with people letting foreigners coming in, like they close basically their, their airports and so on. Uh, so be very, very careful not, not to let everybody in who wants to come into the country. Um, otherwise, I mean, bars are open, coffee shops are open. Um, so that's all very um, loose. They have uh, the, the policy of um, high risk groups protection. So high risk groups are very much protected, like elderly, 
um, how do I say that? I mean, homes for elderly people, they are very much protected and uh, people with um, health issues are very much protected. So they, they have more this idea of protecting those and letting the others kind of protect themselves. I mean, very much like self um, uh, responsibility, I, I would say in, in, in that sense. Um, it works relatively well, but of course the death rates are higher uh, that's, I mean, that's given because in, in play, uh, they, um, but let's see on the long run, uh, they, they think about the herd immunity um, in the herd immunity model. Maybe it works in Sweden. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, so it's very difficult to say. I find it also a very interesting concept. Maybe if it works anywhere, then it probably works in Sweden, I guess. So. <laughs> We're about to find out. <laughs> yeah. Pepper, any thoughts on Sweden? No, I don't have any thoughts. Um, I, I think that basically, you know, a, those of us who teach government are, are, are sort of tired of putting up graphs of, um, you know, how the Scandinavians outperform everyone else. Um, and so we kind of are interested to watch this um, and, and see how, how it goes. Um, I do think that, um, uh, if, if you think about how the um, Swedish debate has gone, it's very much um, trying to balance uh, the risk of those who um, are, are, are at high risk from this um, disease, especially the old, versus the risk of those who are being put out of education. Um, and even in Sweden, you have a society, a society that's becoming more unequal. Um, and so I think that debate has informed uh, the Swedish decisions as well as the science. Um, and I think you'll see this debate happening in other places as places start to open up under that kind of pressure. Who do we favor, uh, the young or the old? So Ricky asks a very challenging question. Um, several of us on, on the panel and in participating in this event focus on democratic innovation and citizen participation. So Ricky asks, do the panelists think that there are any ways that more citizen participation could have been built into the response to coronavirus from the outset? It's a fascinating question because at least my intuition was, well, that would have been very difficult because the thing moved so, so quickly. But then, you know, Brigitte, you brought up the issue of the open letters and the most affected. So spend a couple minutes, anyone on the panel speculating about whether you think that there could have been an earlier baked in participation that would have been constructive and helpful. Well, I can say something. Oh. Yeah, we Hello. hear you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Tom. We can go hear ahead. you. Yeah, go ahead. Me or Brigitte? Sorry, I just lost yeah. you for a moment. Okay. Yeah, go so, on. Uh, well, I think definitely, yeah, <laughs> definitely we should have um, more citizen participation. The question is, um, could we, and I think this, the answer also depends on the different countries, uh, just like we're talking about the Corona app uh, right now, and I was thinking, uh, this is a question for a country like Germany, where I live, this is a debate here, of course, there is technology for doing that, uh, and because people's basic rights are all somehow minimally guaranteed, so you can think on privacy as being like an important right. In Brazil, the situation is, it's, it's so, um, complicated uh, with extreme poverty and so many people like living on poverty and extreme poverty on hunger and inequality it's, it's, it's so huge uh, that there are other rights that come to before uh, as a priority than privacy for example so the same for citizen participation I think it's how much um, civil society can at the moment do in, in any country I mean we also depend now on technology on our computers and internet connection for doing things and how much can we do um, from um, our computer screen what I think it's interesting uh, that took place um, in Latin America, was not, not in Brazil in particular, was a hackathon. A hackathon to uh, come up with, a, to identify problems uh, and uh, the severity of problems in, in specific places and to come up with a, uh, solutions and proposals. I think this is something I'm particularly um, a fan of digital innovations and digital democratic innovations. And I think now we have an opportunity um, to let them develop uh, somehow. And then uh, particularly this mapathons and, uh, and hackathons uh, in which uh, people can contribute with the knowledge and then build up more collective knowledge and social knowledge and also use um, geolocation uh, in order to provide more information. I mean, 
there is a huge need of information at the moment. Um, even in countries where, where the governments want to have information, which is not the case of Brazil, but even in those countries, it's, it's hard to get the information. Um, it depends on state capacity, but it depends on several other variables. So whether people can really provide information and, uh, uh, and then build up some knowledge through uh, technology by those means like mapathons and hackathons, I think this will be very interesting. And this is one thing that I think we, we could, we enthusiasts of democratic innovations um, and we civil society as well, we could use this moment as an opportunity to try to develop further digital democratic innovations and tools um, like those, more instruments of a uh, digital collaboration uh, through mappings and through uh, collaborative uh, proposals for policies and measures and so on. So there is very little. In Latin America, I, uh, my research project identified so far only one um, of those initiatives. Here in Germany, that had been also one right at the beginning, uh, also hackathon. Um, so the, the question is also whether in the middle of this crisis also governments are being responsive to that i mean listening to what people also are trying to to propose um and say very good i think that you know you were in your initial comments i found your stress on information and the lack of information and just data about how many tests or how many sick people there are in brazil uh, very striking and important. In the United States, the main, the reason that we know what the national testing trends are like is because of a crowdsourced citizen effort. I mean, even in a, even in the United States where state capacity is relatively high, information is not necessarily so free flowing, even about basic um, indicators like how many tests there are and that required citizen effort. And I, I imagine as debates and political struggles about how quickly or slowly or exactly how to open up happen, the temptation to juice the numbers one way or another will be um, quite high, is my guess. And so I think probably citizen monitoring plays a role in, in keeping people honest on that. Um, any other thoughts on uh, Ricky's question? And then we'll move on, on to the last question before we close. Yeah. I find the question very interesting. But uh, I mean, the problem is we have absolutely no experience with that. I mean, in all constitutions, it's even said in state of emergency, not even the parliament has anything to say, just the executive. I mean, yeah, that's that's the, and in most constitutions, it says executive emergency uh, rule, something like this, I don't know the English term. So um, just, I mean, making sure the parliament <laughs> is included uh, is a difficult thing, but, um, completely agree with uh, with Ricky that we should think about in this direction, but this is, a, I think this is a very future project. Um, uh, right now, I don't really have an idea, but I think it would be good, at least it would be good to include them now, uh, to include civil society now much more than it is. And yes, when I think about how an emergency, how could this look and maybe, some more accountability afterwards, like the parliament has to agree and legitimize the decisions by the executive later on, mostly. Maybe we could have something similar that the society has to, I don't know, has to uh, approve kind of this severe uh, decisions. So these are just some ideas, but I think we should definitely think in this direction. Um, yeah. <laughs> Those are interesting thoughts. I mean, our the emergency powers, our template is that emergency requires concentrating power in the executive. Mm -hmm. But when we look back on this, we may see that many of the positive things that happened didn't come from the executive. And maybe there's a chance of uh, changing the paradigm of emergency a little bit and broadening it out. Um, mm. And so that, that goes to, uh, we only have time for one more question. And uh, let me ask, Enrique's question, and then also you guys in uh, formulating your responses to Enrique's question, if you offer any closing remarks you uh, have, because we only have about four or five minutes left. So Enrique's question plus any closing thoughts that you have. So Enrique says, how can crises like this impact people's faith in democracy? All state powers at the federal level seem to be bickering constantly and unable to take a consistent response. So there's contrary intuition. Some people say, well, the pandemic will increase people's faith and need in government for 
uh, that we need cap competent government. And so it lays the foundations for that. And Enrique is going the different direction. He's saying, well, we look at what governments around the world are doing and they're fighting with each other. And so maybe this will uh, uh, erode confidence and faith in democracy. So responses to Enrique's thoughts and any concluding thoughts or comments that you wanna leave folks with. Go ahead, why don't we go uh, uh, Pepper, Tommy, and then Brigitte gets to wrap. Well, I, I think it's a great question. Um, uh, and, and, and thank you for, for uh, organizing this conversation, Archon, because it's been really interesting. Um, so I think if you compare the United Kingdom uh, and the United States, um, you can see the uh, advantage of timing because the United Kingdom has this enormous good fortune that we've already had our election. Uh, and so the solution, everyone is trying to solve the same problem now. Um, and you know, there's not gonna be another election for, for four to five years. Um, and so that means that it's not really a, a partisan question. And so even the, the new opposition, uh, the, the opposition's got a new leadership. Um, and so they are trying to be constructive, but critical in the same way that civil society is trying to be constructive, but critical of, of, of responses. So I think um, it's gonna be deeply disruptive in the United States because it's happening right in the middle of a presidential election. Um, and so you're seeing this sort of bickering that's happening between, um, between states and the federal government. And the sort of longer term thought that I would leave you with is that I think that um, the, the effects of the pandemic on, on democracy are gonna be one, the reinforcement of the nation state as locus of decision-making authority. I think that the, um, the European Union will have difficulty with this again, uh, because you'll have sort of different solutions chosen at different levels and it'll be hard for them to come up with, I mean, it's been hard for them to come up with a, a difference between the states that are really suffering and the states that don't wanna give any more money. And, and that's been a sort of, re that's been a, a recurrent trend. Um, and the second is the, the really, uh, what is this, right now we view it as a pandemic, but if, what it really is, is it's a prolonged recession, possibly a depression. Um, and that's what's going to influence us over the long term. And so the question is how your society is gonna divide, whether politics is gonna focus um, on uh, blaming immigrants and calling things the China virus, right? I think that's one very possible outcome in many uh, societies to this uh, sort of problem as we, we close down a lot of borders and borders become more important. And the other question is the sort of divides that we've seen with how well people are living through the crisis between the rich and the poor um, and how that can be dealt with. That's, that's another sort of uh, cleavage that I think we'll, we'll see emerge more strongly in some countries after the crisis. So those are the big stakes to play for for democracy. <laughs> they don't get bigger than that. Tommy. Yeah, I, I like the question um, because it speaks about faith in democracy, which is a concept from John Dewey, right? Um, the democratic faith. And I think that this is it's interesting now um, how our faith on democracy became somehow related to a faith on science, um, <laughs> at least in some places. I think this is definitely something um, for us now um, to, to think about and reflect. I mean, that, that may change something that, I mean, our faith on democracy may also somehow um, change um, because of the need or not, I would say also depending on the country, um, on how the faith on science uh, plays a role um, on leadership. Uh, so it's interesting now, I will have to ask that, I will try to be, to be quick, but I have to, to somehow respond to that uh, at the personal level. I mean, I, I'm a dual citizen um, of Brazil and Germany. I was born and raised in Brazil, but I live here in Germany for almost 10 years now. The two countries are facing this crisis in totally different ways. Um, as a Brazilian, I'm ashamed um, and I'm losing my faith in democracy um, every day more and more. Um, and um, as a German, it's just the opposite. I'm proud <laughs> uh, uh, somehow. Um, I feel um, safe that I have a government that is taking like evidence-based um, political decisions. I'm proud that um, it is so transparent and things are communicated. I mean, in comparison to Brazil, definitely. And uh, that makes a difference. Things are communicated, uh, they're informed, and you have uh, virologists uh, all the time talking publicly. So all decisions are justified. They justify it. They explain it and they justify it. And they also justify it from the point of view of democracy. And, and that makes a difference. And that increases the faith of on democracy, I would say. So um, I think depending on how much um, actually each country is handling the prize, I mean, also the kind of a leadership we have, we can have a different effects um, regarding here how um, trust in political institutions um, will increase or decrease and the so-called faith in democracy as well. Mm -hmm. Over to uh, you, Brigitte, okay. for last yeah. 
I mean, for, for Germany, I would say I see two different um, developments. The one is really, uh, I'm ashamed to say, it, but a wish, this dream of a wise leader. Um, this Angela Merkel, I mean, is putting like on a, on a, how do you say that? I don't know how to say that, but like she knows what to do and we trust her and we need someone who knows what should be done. And that, that scares me, of course, to death. <laughs> That's, you know, this wish for a wise leader is just coming up. The, another development is that people see, oh my God, there's so many different opinions and perspectives, even in science, and it all has to be debated. Nobody knows the truth and every everything is kind of right and we can understand every perspective. So they get a more of a sense how complicated decision-making is and that there's so much to take into account and um, everything has to be debated and it's important to be debated. So this is another development I see that people understand more the different, the need to discuss so many and see and re reflect uh, so many different perspectives. So for me, these are two different developments and I, I don't know where it goes or where it will end, but. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. We're running out of time. Um, we're out of time. We're over time. But this has just been a fantastic discussion. And so, uh, I don't know, for me, uh, energizing and, and rejuvenating in a way that I think we're all suffering under this COVID anxiety and uh, inside our own countries or maybe even our own communities. And it's, it's uh, wonderful to be able to connect with other people who are experiencing the same thing, but in very, very different ways with under very, very different sets of institutions and social conditions and, um, and democracies. And so uh, I just learned a ton and I was just saying to the uh, other participants in the chat that this is uh, definitely one of the most salient and relevant comparative politics discussions that I've been a part of. I mean, usually you talk about, you know, comparative institutions and it, it relates to some abstract topic, but here we're really bringing it to bear on something that every single one of us is uh, living through and will be for some time to come. So thank you very much. And a, a huge thanks to Tommy and Pepper and Brigitte and uh, James and Sarah and Julianne and the other people on the ASH team. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for joining us and look out for our future events. We will be talking more about, uh, certainly more about uh, democracy and more about the democracy, democracy and the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Hey, this was great, you guys. Thank you so much. It was great to organize it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. Good. Thanks. All right. Bye. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.